even though she puts me in a poofy, frilly dress on the first day of school, my mom makes a deal with me after some kicking and screaming. If I'm not going to wear dresses, I still have to dress up, AKA look presentable. For me, that means button-down flannels and or turtlenecks tucked into jeans, accompanied by a pair of penny loafers. It's 1986 and I'm six years old. I feel very clever having discovered that whatever the last integer of the year is equals how old I am. My mom is a young mom and turned 21 a month before she had me. She and I are very close and she supports me expressing myself the way I feel comfortable. My mom is what her classmates refer to as a fresh-faced farm girl. She doesn't wear makeup and is pretty low maintenance. She is happy to wear very simple outfits, including overalls, corduroys, and jeans, work shirts, and button-down flannels, bandanas, and flip-flops. While there are dresses in my closet, my wardrobe is a version of her tomboy style. She is a feminist with communist-informed ideals and cares very little about what other parents have to say, let alone patriarchy. She is a multidimensional woman that started college at 16 and is fluent in German and Spanish. She is that nine to five working girl that commutes to work in Manhattan. I watch her leave the house in her stockings and sneakers, which get replaced with pumps when she gets to work, not as a secretary, but as a proofreader in an industry dominated by men. She lets me know that I can be anything I want to be, and I believe her. I don't generally accept that being told uh, that I can't do something because I'm a girl. If anything, I take it as a challenge. It's 1986 in Astoria, Queens, and most of the Italian, Jewish, and Greek grandmothers don't know what to make of me. Ethnically, I look like I belong to them, which I do not, but I am not fulfilling my girl obligations to wear long hair, dresses, and hues of pink. They pinch my cheeks and speak to me in their native tongues. While I do not belong to their tribes, I am half Dominican and definitely not meeting the beauty standards of my Dominican family. They scrub me of my boy appearance and ask me in a hopeful way if I like any boys when I come to visit them in Washington Heights. My aunt, who is a hairdresser, says, Menaka, mija, and teases and blow dries my hair into a suitably feminine look. I comply even though she will brush hard and expose my tender scalp to what feels like burning. I'm the cousin who gets teased for being white, so I'm happy to fit in, if only for a moment. My other aunt, who is a seamstress, insists on whipping up an outfit with matching tops and bottoms out of whatever fabric is on hand, including the white material with green polka dots. The repairs are promptly repaired as soon as I return to Astoria but the gender expectations are made very clear. My mom even steps in to brain, unbrainwash me after those visits, like when I spent a long stretch of time with them in the Dominican Republic and returned speaking in a squeaky baby voice that doesn't match my age or my personality. <laughs> she has me repeat after her in a normal voice. Hi, mommy. The family and community models I have for femininity wear skin-tight jeans, large earrings, long press-on nails, and big hair. The more Aquanet, the better. <laughs> Women either defer to their men or have strong opinions that are vocally expressed and humored or dismissed as the rantings of hysteria and lack of logic or intelligence. They keep the house clean, the husband and kids fed well and on time, and wait until dad comes home when the kids get out of line. I'm more impressed with strong women I see on screen, like Sigourney Weaver, Jodie Foster, Demi Moore, which will later make much more sense. <laughs> and I love, love, love Madonna, but that's another story about my inner gay boy. It's 1986 and my mom and I are wandering around the below ground department store called Weber's. The store is set up with long aisles of folded jeans and selections of plain multicolored t-shirts. On this day, we are asking the clerk to help us find the girliest colored shirt possible. The reason we chose Weber's for this t-shirt selection adventure is they have this super cool t-shirt press. There are letters in different fonts and colors and various images to select from, from to create a unique design. After some long deliberation, we choose the lilac shirt, 
with the unicorn and rainbow images. More importantly, we choose the letters to spell my first name, Melissa. Don't tell anybody, I'll tell you, tell anybody. And, and the words, I am a girl. I am satisfied with this choice of shirt because I'm often getting confused for a boy. We are out of ideas on how to communicate that I'm a girl, despite my short hair, boyish appearance, and tomboy tendencies. I have pierced ears and, my some, and may sometimes wear an item of clothing purchased in the girls' section, but still get read as a boy. This is an effort to address those strangers that feel the need to reassign my gender without me asking them to. I don't yet understand concepts of gender identity or sexual orientation. I just know how to feel comfortable. I like go-karts, BMX bikes, E-Man, and G.I. Joe. Because now you know. And knowing is half the battle. <laughs> I collect baseball cards and can tell you all the stats of the players' cards I collected. I like to play sports, too. I play Little League and I borrow my batting stance from my hero, Daryl Strawberry, of the New York Mets. 1986 World Series champs. I play on an all-boys soccer team, and everything runs smooth until the day I get a soccer ball straight to the gut. The coach picks me up gingerly and takes me off the field, only for my teammates to observe this special treatment with confusion, because guess what? They didn't know I was a girl. There are issues with me being in spaces like the girls' locker room at the boys' and girls' club where my gender is known, but my gender expression is causing a different type of conversation. For example, while getting into our swimsuits, a 10-year-old -year and her gaggle ask me if I'm a lesbian. I quickly reply, yes. <laughs> Not knowing what a lesbian is, but guessing it must be something cool that I should definitely agree to. <laughs> They all laugh, but not necessarily in a mean way. Maybe they are impressed with my level of self-awareness. It's 1986. I ask my mother to take me to the barber shop to get my hair cut like a boy. I continue running around topless as long as I can possibly get away with it until my body starts to change. I run around the neighborhood playing cops and robbers and manhunt and reenact Andre the Giant vs. Hulk Hogan until the street lights come on and I hear my mom calling me home from our front stoop. I sit with the boys on the playground and throw worms at girls while we chant, we hate girls, yuck! <laughs> the obvious conflict seems to be lost on them, and me for that matter. Our friendship is contained to school, but I still make the cut as one of the boys, which at that time is where I feel most comfortable. I admire Chris P because he's really smart and he's really unique handwriting that I mimic for a little while. John B. is Chris P.'s best friend, so together we form a little trio. When threatened, I do what any boy would do and insist that the inventor in question should suck my dick. <laughs> Meanwhile, no one seems to notice that I do not actually have a dick to suck. Maybe I don't realize this either, or maybe I do, and maybe it's just one of the harshest things I can think of to say to someone. Who knows, I'm six. My favorite movie is The Goonies, and I wear jean jackets and jeans with patches to repair the ripped knees from all the roughhousing and outdoor adventures. The lilac t-shirt does not stay in rotation long. Its purpose, while intended to remove confusion and awkward conversations, adds a new layer for bullying. The conversation shifted to how strange it is for a child to have to declare their gender on a t-shirt. While I may be a target for bullying, I managed to stand my ground, even fighting the school bully one day after he calls me names and does the worst thing he could have done, punch me in my glasses. After the chants of fight, fight, subside, and the crowd disperses from the scene behind this handball wall, a teacher quietly praises me, saying, it's about time. I even witness another teacher clapping. It's a small victory for this tiny framed kid trying to find her place, this future lesbian of America. <laughs>